What's going on, Dolph fans? It is your boy, Dylan, and it's Monday, which means I'm doing my post-game analysis video for you uh, for the New York Jets versus Miami Dolphins yesterday at MetLife Stadium. Um, and so, look, I'm going to get right into it. I'm, you know, trying to keep this short. There is a good amount to talk about. Uh, and normally I start with the injury report, although for some reason I can't seem to find it. Um, you know, uh, which is weird. So, but, you know, we had, you know, some of the same guys like Nick Needham and, and um, Ryan Fitzpatrick, Jerome Baker. Some of those guys obviously were still on the injured, uh, on the injury report, you know, dealing with some minor stuff. Um, Albert Wilson and Devontae Parker did uh, clear the concussion protocol and both played. Uh, and had decent, you know, decent, uh, a decent game. Um, they, you know, had some decent production. Parker had like 72 yards, two scores, whatever. Um, so that's pretty much all the notable stuff from the injuries. I don't know why I can't seem to find it. It's just strange. But, um, yeah, so, like I said, that's pretty much the notable stuff from that. As far as the inactives went, uh, cornerback Tay Haynes, safety Walt Aikens, fullback Chandler Cox, Center guard Keaton Sutherland, center guard Evan Bohm, uh, tackle Adam Pankey, and defensive end Charles Harris were the inactives. <clears throat> um, yeah, so let me go ahead and just get straight into the statistics and everything, and then I'll go ahead through my analysis and whatnot. So Dolphins obviously lost the game, uh, 36 to th uh, excuse me, 36 to 20. Uh, we are now three and eleven. That also puts the Giants at three and eleven. Um, we had for the game we had 384 total yards. They had 412. We had 262 passing yards. They had 274. We had 122 rushing yards. They had 138. We were 5.6 yards per play. They were 6.5. We had one fumble. They had three interceptions. Uh, so we actually won the turnover battle there. So that's not why we lost the game at all. Um, we were 23% on third down. They were 45. That obviously didn't help, but that didn't decide it either. We were 28, had the ball for 28 minutes and 53 seconds. They had it for 31 minutes and 7 seconds. We had seven penalties. They had four, which the past few games, and I'll talk about this a little more, We've had, you know, a lot more penalties. We obviously started off the year as the least penalized uh, team, but the past several games, that has been increasing. Um, so that's obviously not good. Um, and that's part of why we lost. Uh, but like I said, I'll get into that in a minute. Ryan Fitzpatrick was 23 of 41, 56.1% completion percentage for 279 yards, two touchdowns, and a 93.4 passer rating. Eli Manning was 20 for 28, 71.4% completion percentage, 283 yards, two touchdowns, three interceptions, and an 87.9 passer rating. Patrick Laird led the way for us uh, in rushing, 12 rushes, 46 yards, and a three-point average. But let's be clear, though. First of all, obviously, he didn't, you know, get that much. He only had 46 yards on 12 rushes, just shy of four yards in average. But... Part of the reason why we lost this game is because, like, every time Patrick Laird started having production, they would, like, stop using him. Um, so it's a little bit misleading there um, as well, um, you know, and, and I'll get into that a little bit more uh, in my analysis as well in just a minute. Miles Gaskin had nine rushes, 43 yards, and a 4.8 average. Most of that actually came, like, towards the end of the game when it didn't really matter anyway. When we were down a bunch and they were, you know, playing softer coverages, didn't really worry about the run as much. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, whatever. So, Ryan Fitzpatrick also threw in four rushes, 33 yards, and an 8-3 average. Obviously, those were just scrambles, you know, him trying to get away from pressure, which he was under all day. Saquon Barkley led the way for them, 24 rushes, 112 yards, two touchdowns, and a 4-7 average. A lot of that came in the second half when our defense was worn down and so on and so forth, and he just started running the ball all over us. Plus, uh, you know, they had a, a considerable lead, so they just ran Saquon down our throats in the second half. Javaris Allen had eight rushes, 28 yards, a touchdown, and a three average. 
Receiving, Devontae Parker led the way 4 of 7, 72 yards and 2 touchdowns. He's like 40 yards away from hitting 1,000 on the season, which is cool. Um, you know, so that's like one of the bright spots, I guess. Albert Wilson was 5 of 8 for 59 yards. Mike Kosicki, 4 of 8, 47. Clyde Walford, 2 of 4 for 34. Miles Gaskin, 2 of 3, 29. Isaiah Ford, 3 of 5, 21. Sterling Shepard led the way for them, 9 out of 11 uh, for 111 yards. Golden Tate, 1 of 4, 51 yards and a score. Caden Smith, 3 of 3, 38 yards. Saquon Bar Barkley, 4 of 5 for 31. Darius Slayton, 2 of 3, 31 yards and a touchdown. Cody Latimer, 1 of 2 for 21. There was one fumble in the game. Like I said, Ryan Fitzpatrick had the fumble for us, uh, and the fumble was lost. The, uh, the, the Giants got it. Uh, defensively, Jerome Baker led the way for us. Six, uh, six solo tackles, six assisted, one interception, 34 yards, 434 yards in a pass defense. Uh, Jamal Wiltz. And by the way, out of the three interceptions, we definitely won the turnover battle, unless you count like the turnover on downs that we had um, at one point. I mean, we still won the turnover battle, but um, two of those, you know, the... Um, the Vince Beagle one, it was good, you know, for him to be in the right place at the right time. But, I mean, that was mostly on Eli. That was just a bad a bad throw by him, uh, bad at reading the defense. And he just threw it right into the waiting arms of, of uh, Vince Beagle. Um, but it was his first career interception, so good for him. Um, and then the Nick Needham one was at, like, six seconds left to go in the uh, first half. And it was it, you know, an overthrown pass into double coverage. So, you know, I only say that just because, like I said, I like to give you guys full context. So, you know, the Jerome Baker one, that was a really good interception. I mean, that was still kind of on Eli. He should have seen the, the linebacker underneath. But, you know, the, the players definitely did take advantage of those mistakes by Eli to come away with those, those interceptions. Jamal Wiltz was four, had four solo tackles, five assisted with a pass defense. Nate Brooks had four solo tackles. Adrian Colbert threw in three solo, two assisted. Nick Needham had three solo, one assisted, one interception for 23 yards and a pass defense. Eric Rowe had three solo, one assisted. Vince Beagle, two solo, three assisted, two tackles for loss, an interception, seven yards and a pass defense. Devon Godshaw, two solo, three assisted, uh, three assisted with a tackle for loss. And Sam McGuaven had one solo, one assisted, one sack, one tackle for loss, and a pass defense. Sam Beal led the way for them, eight solo, three assisted tackles, a tackle for loss, and a pass defense. David Mayo, six solo tackles, a tackle for loss. DeAndre Baker, five solo, one assisted tackle, two passes defense. Antoine Bethay, five solo tackles, and a pass defense. Dion Buchanan, four solo, two assisted. Just, uh, Julian Love, four solo, one assisted, two tackles for loss, and a pass defense. Leonard Williams, three solo tackles and a forced fumble. Corey Ballantyne, three solo tackles and a pass defense. RJ McIntosh, two solo, one sack, one tackle for loss. Uh, Dalvin Tomlinson, one solo, two assisted, one sack and a tackle for loss. Marcus Golden, one solo, two assisted and a half sack. Alec Ogletree, one solo, two assisted and a pass defense. Michael Thomas, one solo, one pass defense. O'Shane Zimenez, uh, half, um, excuse me, a an assisted tackle and a half sack. Lorenzo Carter, an assisted tackle and a pass defense. In the kicking game, Jason Sanders was two of three on his field goals with a long of 47, two for two on his extra points. Aldrich Rosas had uh, no field goals, but four or five on his extra points. Matt Hawk was, had three punts, a 42 average, two inside the 20, a long of 50. Solid day for him. Riley Dixon, five punts, 41.8 average, two inside the 20, along at 53. Trevor Davis had two kickoff returns for 27 and a half average, along at 30. Cody Latimer had two for a 24 and a half average, along at 28. Damari Scott had one for 34 yards. And in the punt return, we didn't have any. Uh, Damari Scott had one for nine yards. So getting to the analysis for this game, obviously, the four things I look at, did we win, how competitive were we, injuries, and bright spots. So obviously we did not win. In fact, we ended up getting our asses handed to us by a, you know, pretty bad team. 
uh, the Giants. And as far as I'm concerned, it was mostly due to um, the coaching staff, right? So as far as I'm concerned, the coaches lost us this game. Now, there's some things that they are directly responsible for, and then there are some things that they are indirectly responsible for. Um, and I'll get into that as we break this down. So we did start the game off pretty competitive. We ended up scoring the first touchdown. It was a beautiful pass from Fitzpatrick to Parker. Um, you know, and we led at halftime 10 to 7, right? The Dolphins offense did move the ball all right throughout the game. Um, you know, the Dolphins defense held pretty firm throughout the first half, but they kind of broke down. That definitely broke down in the second half. Um, so we did start the game off competitive, but one of the things that was super annoying and frustrating in this game was at the very beginning, Patrick Laird had like uh, three or four plays that were positive production, good stuff, and then they just took him out and just stopped playing him for a significant portion of the game right after that it was like after our second drive patrick laird comes out they put miles gaskin in and he doesn't do like almost anything and then you know he gets like uh patrick laird got like one play until somewhere in like uh, you know maybe one or two plays until somewhere into like the midway of the third quarter um and then they put him back in, he got like another couple plays that were good, and then they stopped using him again and started using Miles Gaskin again. And, you know, to be fair, again, Miles Gaskin towards the end of the game started getting some production, but it was at the end of the game when it didn't even really fucking matter anymore, and they didn't care so much about stopping the run. Um, so, like, you know, just their, their use of their best running back is absolutely fucking maddening. Either they don't use him, or when they when he starts showing production, they, like, take him out and stop using him. Um, so that's, that's part of why I say that the, the coaching staff, uh, at least, at the very least, helped us to lose this game. As far as I'm concerned, the coaching staff really fucking lost us the game. Um... You know, so, like I said, the usage of Pas Patrick Laird was just maddening. Uh, the Dolphins' first drive stalled with a miss, miss, missed field goal, so obviously that didn't help. Um, and then that ended up being, you know, a turnover. Um, turnover, turnover on downs, we missed the field goal. Um, you know, so if you count that, and then the second drive we had was a turnover on downs. If you count that, I guess you could say the turnover battle was even. Um, the, you know, only really interceptions and fumbles really count towards the turnover battle. I don't know why they don't count, like, turnover on downs. But, you know, whatever. You take those out, we won the turnover battle. So that's not why we lost the game. Um, it was, you know, the misusage of Patrick Laird. Definitely the miss, missed field goal didn't help. But that certainly didn't, you know, that was not the game-breaking thing right that didn't certainly didn't determine the outcome um you know we were still competitive even after that the the, the defense was still holding solid um you know whatever but then on our second drive okay on our second drive of the game we get the ball back we move downfield and we get into let's see the dolphins were on the giants 10 yard line it was fourth and one with 225 left to go in the first quarter and the Dolphins coaching staff decides to call a run play straight up the middle. Okay, the, the, the offensive line is hot garbage. It has been the entire year. Our run game has been hot garbage the entire year. And, you know, the Giants broke straight through the line, tackle for loss, and it was a turnover on downs. There were so many better things that they could have done, right? Instead of that, either they could have kicked the field goal and got the, the three points because uh, it would have been, a, you know, essentially a chip shot field goal, right? Take the three points and take the lead. That's one, you know, good, easy option, right? And so, like, everybody's like, oh, you know, uh, but Brian Flores is aggressive. Okay, well, this is another example, just one of the many examples, the long list of examples of where he's aggressive and it turned out to be a massive failure. Okay, 
So, you know, but they also could have just done something different, right? They could have done like a little RPO play action pass. They could have done, you know, a pass out to the flat really quick. They needed one yard, right? They could have done like a, a short hitch or a slant. There are a ton of things that they could have tried that would have been a lot better. And, and, and had they done something like that, I at least would have said, okay, especially early on in the game, right? Um, since it was still zero to zero at that point, I, I would have at least been like, okay, it's aggressive and it, it failed, but I at least understand, you know, the play call. It was, a, it was a decent play call. You know, it's still risky at that point. I mean, it was zero, zero, zero. Like, first of all, the decision to go for it on fourth down was unnecessarily risky considering the status of your offensive line, your run game, blah, 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 right? So the decision alone um, was questionable. But then the play call itself, why would you try and run the ball up the gut to get the first down when your offensive line sucks, your run game sucks, so on and so forth? There were so many better things you could have done to get it. So again, an aggressive um, shot by Brian Flores that ends up in a massive fucking failure. Okay? Um, also, let's note that part of this uh, and what, part of why we lost... Uh, there were definitely a bunch of drop passes in this game. Patrick Laird had a couple. Clive Walford had a couple, um, right? But that is indirectly on the coaching staff. Why? Why do I say that? Because if you look at it, why were there drop passes? Well, because you have, in like Laird's case, he's young, he's inexperienced, um, blah, 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 blah. Uh, in Clive Walford's case, I mean, he's just kind of like, you know, an average tight end maybe at best, right? So why is that indirectly uh, linked to the coaching staff and also the front office, right? Because they designed this team systematically to be young and experienced, low talent, low production, um, you know, all of that stuff. And when you design a team like that, of course you're going to get... Um, you know, mistakes, missed assignments, penalties, right? Because there were a lot of penalties in that in this game. That's another way in which uh, this coaching staff is directly, or excuse me, indirectly responsible. All the waiver wire pickups, like Nate Brooks got a penalty, right? And and had some missed assignments. We just picked him up like two days ago, right? Now part of that is injuries, which is also indirectly. Uh, the coaching staff and front office's fault. Why? Because when you put a uh, far less competitive product on the field, right, even against bad teams, even against like the Jets and and the Giants, right, even against team, the Redskins, even against teams that are bad, we still are far less competitive because the, the talent level across the board is just substantially different to the to the team you're playing against. So when you have that, and then when you combine that with the fact that you got a, a bunch of like undrafted guys, waiver wire guys, backups, and practice squad guys, they're playing hard for their careers and their play their paychecks. They're trying to put good film out there, so they're gonna make mistakes, right? And so again, that is indirectly the the penalties the drop passes the the blown assignments right stuff like that the mistakes by young inexperienced players is indirectly the responsibility of the coaching staff and the uh, and the well i mean it's it's not even indirect because they did it on purpose right the the front office did it on purpose so that way and the coaching staff, Brian Flores, admit that he had had a hand in, like, all the transactions that we've done, right? So they intentionally designed this team to be low talent, low leadership, low production, so on and so forth. So that way they could be bad, so that way they could get a high draft pick, so that way they could get a quarterback in this upcoming draft. So it's actually a little bit more direct on them than it is indirect, Um but, you know, at the same time, the players do still have some responsibility, but certainly far less than the coaching staff in front office because, you know, they didn't ask for it. They were just put in this situation and they're doing the absolute best that they can. Again, trying to put good film on tape and so on and so forth. Things like that fourth down play, 
okay, uh, where they decide to run up the gut, that is super directly on the coaching staff. It was just an absolute terrible decision. Um, also, there was another instance later in the game. The Dolphins had the ball on their own one-yard line after a penalty on a punt um, that ended up, you know, half the distance to the goal. And then they had a false start on first down, half the distance to the goal. So we ended up, at, like, we were like just shy of the one-yard line. It was a first and 11 with 6.24 left to go in the third quarter. And again, they tried to run the ball up straight up the middle, straight up the gut in the in the... Uh, Giants defense and why why I mean they got guys like Leonard Williams there and so on and so forth it's just an absolutely stupid decision there were so many better things that you could do especially with a garbage offensive line and a garbage run game um, that you could have uh, done to at least get yourself out of your your end zone but it ends up in a safety and after that that's when the hinges fell off and we just couldn't do anything because the, the defense was then worn down. You know, we kept with the penalties. They kept popping up. Um, you know, and then Saquon just got run down our throats because at that point we couldn't stop them for shit. Right? So, and then, they, you know, they built up a good lead, so on and so forth. Um, and then the last thing was at the very end of the game, two minutes... Uh, like under two minutes, right? The two minute warning had already sounded, right? You know, under two minutes, the Giants had the ball and okay, so yes, there were a couple negative plays, right? So we stopped them either, you know, like a loss of a yard or two or no gain, whatever. And Brian Flores uses our last two timeouts. But why? You, we were down 16 points. There's less than two minutes left to go in the game. Your offense has been pretty much garbage the entire game. Well, they've been okay. They were okay, but the offensive line has been garbage. Ryan Fitzpatrick was under, you know, a bunch of pressure. Their defense got a bunch of tackles for losses and a couple sacks, right? A bunch of passes defense, right? Like, all this stuff. And so why? You're not going to get the ball back and, and overcome 16 points. All that did was add injur uh, insult to injury. Why are you going to prolong the game using your last two, two timeouts within the last, you know, two minutes of the game when they have the ball? Like, it just doesn't make any fucking sense whatsoever. Okay, so... It's just... It's, it's super frustrating. It's super frustrating to me because this is another example, just like in the Redskins game, that, um... That, uh two-point conversion instead of just going for the extra point and taking it to overtime where you would have had a lot better chance of winning the game, right? The coaching staff made a decision, used the wrong personnel, had a terrible play call, and that was a, a decision they made that lost us the game, okay? And they did it, uh, you know, again, I mean, we can have this argument, although to me it doesn't seem like much of an argument, but we can have the argument that, you know, they just made a mistake or blah, 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 whatever. But no, they did it on purpose because the directive from Stephen Ross was to lose and to be bad so we could get a top pick so we could get a quarterback. So that was directly responsible. Uh, the responsibility was directly on the coaching staff for losing the Washington Redskins game. It was same thing with that third and 20 play. Uh... And the Steelers game. The coaching staff lost us this game. So at the end of the day, the reason why we lost this game, penalties affected us, uh, drop passes. So those things are directly, indirectly responsible or, or attributed to the coaching staff and the front office for designing this team to be low talent, blah, 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 right? And then stupid on-field decisions like the fourth and one play and then the play that got us a safety when we were, you know, on our own goal line, right? So, you know, I mean, look, man, you know, people, people have this idea that things are going to turn around and, you know, next year we're going to be all competitive and blah, 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 blah. And look, again, I've said it many times. I hope that they prove me wrong. I seriously doubt that they're gonna, and there is a, 
lot of evidence, an overwhelming amount of evidence to suggest that that is not going to be the case. But to be fair, we still have to wait and see. We have to wait and see how, you know, our draft um, positioning is, how they handle the draft, blah, 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 blah. And so they have time, right? Um, I'm not convinced. I think that after like year three, I think we're going to go through this mess and madness for another two years. And then at somewhere after like year three, three and a half years, maybe halfway into year four, Brian Flores is going to get scapegoated and uh, fired because Stephen Ross, uh, you know, grows impatient after, you know, a few years of things not working out exactly how he wanted him to, right? Um, but again, to be fair, we'll have to see. Real quick, uh, as far as injuries go, we didn't really have any injuries, so that's good. Um, bright spots, there were a couple. I mean, you know, Devontae Parker had a solid game. He's closer to a 1,000 yards. So that's like one of the few bright spots on the season. Uh, obviously, Jerome, we did get three interceptions. The, the, the best one was Jerome Baker's. Um, you know, Nick Needham does continue to show some some flashes and some consistency. Vince Beagle, you know, showed some good things. And, and Sam McGuavin, those guys pop up every now and again. But at the end of the day, again, they're just pretty much average guys, right? So, you know, again, if people think that we're not going to have uh, a bunch of roster turnover next season, you're kind of fooling yourself, right? Um... And so, um, it's, like, as far as bright spots overall go, you know, I mean, we're not really, we're not really going to, uh, I mean, there's not much. There's not much going for next year, right? Because part of this whole year apparently is to evaluate and to figure out who's going to be here next year. Well, there's really not much to work with, right? We don't really have like any superstars or cornerstone players on this team except for Xavier Howard and maybe Devontae Parker at this point if he continues his resurgence. But after that, it's nothing but pretty much just like average guys, right? And so to, to play to that point, I'd like to read a couple tweets from Matt Infante, uh, who is a person that oftentimes I very much disagree with because he says ridiculous shit. But he makes a, a few good points here. First of all, he says, Mercifully, there are only two games left in this dumpster fire of a season for the Dolphins, uh, one which has seen 80 players get regular season snaps, and of those 80, are there even eight that we can identify as definitely part of the long-term solution? I'm not sure. That's not good. And he's right about that, because what do we have? We don't really have much of anything. But that, again, goes to the, the evaluation uh, abilities of this front office and this coaching staff and what have you. It has been terrible to this point. The other tweet that he uh, put out that I want to read, he says, I just saw a poll from May where 1,200 Dolphins fans voted and 95% graded their 29 dra uh, 2019 draft haul as an A or B. As we close in on the end of the 2019 season, this draft class is probably no better than a C- minus or a D+. Plus. I mean, it's only one year, so this can change, but woof, right? So, he's right there, and he is fair to say that it is only the first year, right? So, it is absolutely correct that you cannot fully evaluate until these players, until they've had, you know... Uh, the players individually until they've like com completed their their rookie seasons right you can't say that e any one of these players is a bust until you know they've had a few years to develop and adjust to the nfl and so on and so forth right um but as as far as the draft class goes and the ability of this coaching staff and front office and power structure to get it right well, their very first draft is exceptionally underwhelming. Let's go through it again, right? Um, Christian Wilkins, he's been okay at best. Chandler Cox, he's been like MIA the vast majority of the season. He's been on the inactives list quite a bit. Um, let's see, Miles Gaskin hasn't done hardly anything the entire year. He was inactive for like the first 10 games and he's been okay at best uh, when he's been in. Let's see. 
Who else do we got? Michael Dieter has been a hot mess the entire season. He's been garbage. Um, let's see. Who else do we have? Uh, uh, Isaiah Prince got cut by the team and picked up by another team. So that's one of our draft picks gone halfway through the first year. Um, I mean, it's just the first, the first, and that's part of the reason along with the you know thousand other players that have come and go on this roster as to why i say that this coaching staff in front office along with the fact that steven ross is so desperately craving to get a quarterback that he's going to neglect other areas and so on and so forth that we already know they're going to be big spenders in free agency which hasn't proven especially with this organization to be a winning strategy i don't trust them to get it right whatsoever going forward so, and again, they, there's still time and they can prove me wrong, but I just, I don't see it. I don't see it at all. And there's so far through their first season there, and, and then you throw in the fact that none of this had to happen anyway. Minka Fitzpatrick balling out for the Steelers, Ryan Tannehill balling out. Now they did lose to the Texans this week. Uh, but Ryan Tannehill did his thing. He gave them a shot, so on and so forth. They just came up a little short. I think they lost by three points. Um, Kenyon Drake just had in his uh, in their uh, the Cardinals win over the Browns this week had a four touchdown game. He's been balling out as the back for the Arizona Cardinals. They just happen to not be a very good team overall this season. Kyler Murray's in his first year. He's got to take some time to get adjusted, right? And they have some other things that they need to fix. Um, Let's see. Again, Frank Gore continuing to set records as, uh, as the Buffalo, you know, in Buffalo. And they're, you know, secure. They've secured a playoff spot. I think they secured a playoff spot. They're close. Um, let's see. Who else? Uh, Robert Quinn, near or surpassed. I, don't, I haven't seen his stats in a couple weeks, but the last time I checked, he had nine and a half sacks, right? So, uh, the, the, the Texans, right, are looking to go to the playoffs, should make it to the playoffs. And, and Laramie Tunsil and Kenny Stills are both doing great things for that team and helping them to get there, right? So when you throw in the fact that their first draft is massively underwhelming, that their talent evaluation has been terrible to this point, um, oh yeah, Josh Rosen is also considered in this, in this draft class. And, you know, they said today they're in no rush to put him in. And, you know, he doesn't look like he's going to be part of the, the long-term future at all at this point. So that's a waste of this year's second-round pick and a fifth-round pick from next year, right? So this the, the draft class is massively underwhelming, to say the least. Their talent evaluation has been absolutely garbage. And then, you know, like... The vast majority of the players, Kiko Alonso, doing good things for the Saints. They're going to go to the playoffs. So, you know, all the players they got rid of have proven since leaving the Dolphins that they didn't need to get rid of them because they are good players that they could have, you know, built around and, and continued things, so on and so forth. It was Steven Ross's craven desperation that he decided to hit the fucking tank button, right? So that started this whole thing. Also, let's note that um, the only team that we have that comes close to what the Dolphins have done, right, because we've decided to tank a lot harder than what the Browns did, but the only team that comes close to showing an example in the NFL of one that potentially could be successful is the Browns. And yes, they've accrued a bunch of talent, but they're struggling immensely. They just lost to the, to the Cardinals this week, who are not a good team. And there, there have been several reports recently of a bunch of Browns that want out now. So they're, first of all, with all that talent and all those high draft picks, they're going to have cap issues, okay, which the Dolphins are going to have as well if we end up having, you know, if we're going to uh, spend big in free agency, which they already said they're going to do. And then with all these high draft picks and so on and so forth, I mean, that also depends on whether or not they pan out or you know whatever but um so aside from the cap issue now all these players want out jarvis landry wants out obj wants out right so the Browns situation is still a disaster they're four years into their rebuild and uh they're not even close to having what the ultimate goal is the ultimate goal of the the tank is to eventually get to the point where you have sustained success they haven't even achieved it yet in their four years in
okay? And I don't know why people think that this Stephen Ross, Chris Greer, and this uh, uh, coaching staff in front office is going to do things any better when they've proven to this point that they are terrible at evaluation and so on and so forth, okay? Um, also, I want to quickly note that, again, in this game, and I don't remember... Um, I don't remember exactly what it is. I forgot to, to take a note of it, and I tried really hard to find it uh, in the game, but Brian Flores, again, on the sideline, threw a little fucking temper tantrum over something. I don't remember what it was in this game, um, but it was, again, silly. Um, and he's done that several times throughout the season, but people keep being like, oh, that's what we want. But every single time that he's done it, every single time, that Brian Thor Flores has been caught on the sidelines throwing a hissy fit and people have talked about it. Every single one of them was a massive or, um, excuse me, was, he was just wrong. He was just flat out wrong, right? The fourth and one play where it was a designed rollout for Ryan Fitzpatrick. He was clearly short and he just throws a fucking temper tantrum last week, okay, against the Jets. Now... Uh, real quick, there was a report put out that Brian Flores got fined $25,000 for his temper tantrum last week. Let me read a little bit of this article. Miami Dolphins head coach Brian Flores is $25,000 poorer on top of his team being 3-11. According to NFL Network's Ian Rappaport, Flores was fined $25,000 by the NFL for his vociferous argument against the late pass interference review, one that included him getting up close and personal with referee Craig Ro uh, Rolstad during last week's 22-21 loss to the New York Jets. Uh... Right, so with 47 seconds remaining in regulation in Miami leading 21-19, officials reviewed a third and 18 passing play that went incomplete between Jets quarterback Sam Darnold and receiver Vincent Smith. Afterward, a defensive pass interference call was assessed to Dolphins rookie cornerback Nick Needham. Right now, Nick Needham says it was a bad call, blah, 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 but it was a good call. He said that because it was him that got called for it, so that's not really a surprise there, but... Upon review, and let's see, real quick, let me read what uh, Al Riveron had to say. Uh, let's see. NFL Senior Vice President of Officiating, Al Riveron, explained the reasoning behind the reversal. After we look at it, we get a couple of replays which show us that it's clear and obvious that the defender grabs the receiver by his shoulder, the right shoulder, turns him prior to the ball getting there, and significantly hinders him before the ball arrives. Okay? It was a good call. Who cares that this, like, and people wanted to be like, some people said to me like, well, but, you know, why did they even review it when it was an incomplete pass on the field? About That's what the officiating is supposed to do, and they actually got it right this time, right? And not to mention, this is the first year that pass interference has actually even been reviewable, so, you know... There's obviously going to be uh, mistakes made along the way in the learning process as they go along, and there have been a ton of them. But they were 100% right about this. So, you know, just constantly the dude's throwing little fucking hissy fits and temper tantrums on the sideline for absolutely no reason whatsoever. Um, and it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous, and he got fined for it. So that's, you know, that's not what I want in my head coach. If he is, and, you know, to be fair, some of the players, you know, said, yeah, you know, we like it that he fights for us. But again, it doesn't, it doesn't say good things to me that your coach only apparently fights for you in moments when he's just dead ass wrong and is just doing nothing more than throwing a fucking temper tantrum. And then because the rest of the game, he's just walking along the sideline like, yep. Yeah, uh-huh, we're getting our asses beat, but whatever. I'm not going to throw fucking tantrums now, you know, when we're getting our asses handed to us. Why? Because the only times he does it is, is in moments where he feels like he can, you know, put on a show so that way it seems as if he really gives a shit. But he doesn't give a shit. He is part of the tank, and he has been part of the systemic breakdown of this team and has a long list of reasons and examples of why he's uh, intentionally put this team in bad position to, to win and be successful. So, you know, 
I mean, whatever, dude. Look, again, people can feel how they want to feel about it. I'm the only one that, that really points these things out and whatever, and they still have time to prove me wrong. But at the end of the day, unless they turn this thing completely around in the next, like, two or three, you know, two seasons, Brian Flores will get scapegoated because Steven Ross is going to be... Imp I mean, think about it. Uh, Adam Gase took us to the playoffs in his first season, 10 and 6. We had, you know, mediocre seasons after that, right? Like seven wins, six wins, whatever, due to things that were not under his control. And we didn't need to hit the reset button at all, but Stephen Ross got impatient. If you look at his track record, uh, almost, almost like clockwork, three to three and a half years, and a coach gets fired under Stephen Ross. So Brian Flores is not going to last long enough. And unless they have some massive turnover or turnaround in the next two seasons, the same thing is going to happen. And then I will be proven right yet again, as I have been the vast majority of this season, that this was all for naught and, was, and it's going to be a massive failure. Real quick before I end this, let me go ahead and look at the uh, draft positioning. As it stands, the Bengals are at number one. Giants are at number two. We moved up to three. Um, although technically we do have the same record as the Washington Redskins, so we're both three and 11, and we also have the exact same strength of schedule, which is, uh, 0.493. Now, it's actually curious to me, though, why we moved up to the third spot. I'm actually just thinking about it right now. And the only reason why is because we have the same record. We have the exact same strength of schedule, but the Washington Redskins beat us. So they should hold like, although I guess, I guess technically, no, I guess that actually makes sense because technically that would mean they have like the tiebreaker over us which would be useful in like you know playoff impl implications okay so never mind i've thought it through that makes sense and so we are we did move up to three washington's at number four detroit detroit at five cardinals at six jets at seven jacksonville at eight chargers at nine denver at ten and the Jets from number seven to Denver all have only five wins. Cardinals only have four. Detroit, you know, the Washington Redskins, blah, 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 only have three. Um, you know, so that obviously can still change a little bit. We only have two games left, so it's getting pretty close to the final lineup. Our picks from the Steelers and the Texans currently sit at 22 and 23. Um... You know, so we'll have to see. But, I mean, unless we somehow manage to get the second pick, even with the second pick, who are we going to take? Chase Young, he's not going to be in the draft. Tua Tagovailoa, if we take him with the second pick, the third pick, the fourth pick, I think that's going to be a massive disaster um, and a waste. Um, but we'll see, right? So we have to wait and see how that all plays out um, going forward and, you know, see what happens. Um... Yeah, so look, at the end of the day, like I said, I mean, there's still a lot that has to play out, so I could be wrong about this, but I think this is all going to be a massive disaster. I think that we lost this past game, a winnable game against the Giants, because of uh, the coaching staff more than anything. The players were certainly giving it their all, you know, uh, and so on and so forth, so... Um, We'll see, man. We'll see. I mean, we got two games left, and then we'll be able to start getting into the off-season talk and start, you know, figuring out where, you know, we're actually going to be picking. I mean, the 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 Steelers and Texans are going to be in the playoffs, so those picks aren't going to be uh, determined definitively until they either, you know, win out or lose. So we'll have to wait, uh, you know, into the playoffs to figure that out. So there's still a lot that needs to happen. Um, so right now, I mean, you know, it's just speculation and so on and so forth. So, I don't know. Look, I'm just, I'm fucking, I'm frustrated, man. I'm, because I'm just, I'm, we didn't need to have this garbage season. None of this shit needed to happen. And it's just been, you know, a massive disaster, a super mess. And it's the responsibility of Stephen Ross, Marvin Allen, Chris Greer, Reggie McKenzie, and Brian Flores. It is all their fault. And 
it's going to end up in, you know, more disaster the next couple years. They're not going to get it right. And uh, that's my prediction. And then it's just going to be wasted years. It's just going to be wasted talent, right? Xavier Howard is going to, you know, his, his prime years are going to be wasted. Blah, 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 blah. I hope they prove me wrong, but I seriously doubt it. And so, you know, we'll see. If they do, I'll be happy to, to, to report otherwise. But until then, they continue to prove me right. And they continue to prove how uh, much of a disaster it is. And how, you know, bleak the, the future actually looks. Despite, you know, people being fooled into some false hope that, that things are going to turn around next season. Which is absolutely ridiculous. Anyway, so... Uh, with that, guys, I'm going to go ahead and end this video. I hope you guys enjoy my videos and my perspective. If you do, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Make sure you hit the like button. Make sure you hit the bell if you want to get the alerts. Make sure you share my videos and my channel with your friends and family. Leave your questions, comments, and concerns down in the comment section. And, of course, as always, make sure you follow me on Twitter at Dylan Tartaro. And with that, I am out. I'll see you all soon. Fins up.